say good morning, everyone. I know you've just seated, but let us stand and quiet our hearts before God. In this stillness, I'd like to invite you to center your mind on God as I read a passage from His Word from Titus 3. Titus 3, verse 3 records that at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We live in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, He saved us. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. So that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, He saved us. Dear God, we thank You so much that we are recipients of Your great and extreme kindness towards us. While we are still living in sin and spiritually dead, you, in your kindness, saved us. Not because of any righteous things we have done, not because we ever deserve it, and it is also out of no contributions on our part, but it is those who believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus are brought from darkness and death into light and life. We thank you, God, for giving us this new life in you, in Christ that cleanses us from sin and points us to the new way we should live in your spirit. Dear Lord, we thank you for your great, your generous, this extreme kindness and goodness that you showed to us. And today we come before you to praise you and adore you with our lips the meditation of our hearts and our mind. Dear friends, in response, come, let us worship and adore God, for He is so good. He's so good to us. Let us sing God is so good.
that we can look to you for your kindness and your love towards us. So as we continue to sing this song, thank you, Jesus. May we sing it out of our heart's gratitude.
from a lyrics of a song that you take our life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee will you take our moments and our days and let them flow in ceaseless praise unto you take these hands of ours and let them move at the impulse of your love will you take our feet and let them be so sweet and beautiful for thee as we take your gospel to the people around us. We pray that you take our voices. Let us always sing only for you, our Lord and King. Take our lips and let them be filled with messages from you, Lord, from your word so that you can edify others. We can build each other up pray that you take whatever resources we have, our silver, our gold, and may we not withhold them, Lord, for all of them belong to you. And Lord, we also want to take, we ask that you take our will, we take what we long for, and may we make it yours. It shall be no longer ours. Take our heart, it is yours, Lord. It shall be yours. So Lord, I pray that you enable us to continue in this posture of worship as we give to you our tithes and offering and as we listen to your word through Pastor Oliver. In the name of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Indeed, beyond the tithes, Scripture in Romans 12, brothers and sisters, says, In view of God's mercy, beyond the tithes, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. It is a holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true, and this is a proper worship. We're going to collect our tithes and offering. One of the key distinctions, a mark of the gathering of people, one of the key distinctions and mark of being a follower of Jesus Christ is in fact our love for one another. And so later on in Romans 12, may I just encourage you again, the scripture says, therefore let love for one another be genuine. Would you detest, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with a brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honour, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope together, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer for one another. And verse 13, contributes to the needs of the saints and to show hospitality, showing love to strangers and more so even to friends. Brothers and sisters gathered. So would you prepare your hearts to give the offering as a token, physical token, but more so I think God is calling us daily to give our lives as an offering. So as Chelsea has prayed, allow me to lead us in that posture right now, Lord, you have given your all, and you've given all that you have, that we may have life, and have it to the eternal. So in view of what you have done on that cross, and to the coming, your second coming once again, then we count all things here a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing you as our Lord and our Saviour. As we give back this token, we recognize, O oh God, that you have loved us and therefore we can love one another dearly. And therefore we can contribute generously. So even through our giving to the saints, to the Christians, to our brothers and sisters in this family here, 
and to the family beyond as we think about our missionaries overseas. Thank you, God, that your people have been blessed and therefore we bless you in our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us just take the next two, three minutes to give our tithes in various forms and means and shortly we'll just invite Pastor Oli up to lead us in the Word. Just pray for our children too as they depart for both their Sunday school and I know today is a toddler's class also. Let's just pray for our children as they move off. Dear Lord, we pray for our children that even as their time temporarily separated with us as a family, may their learning be so rich. May the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ touch their heart that they may come to faith and, and in love with you. For the rest of us, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. As we come to God's Word this morning, let us pray. Let us pray. Father God, what we know not, teach us. What we are not, make us. What we have not, give us. Lord, we ask that you open our eyes to the wonderful things in your Word, and may we see the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of Jesus Christ. And in so seeing, we pray that your Holy Spirit, through your Word, change us to be more and more like Jesus in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, have you had that one colleague who when you find out he professes to be a Christian, you could hardly believe it. You know, he's unkind with his words to colleagues. He uses office politics to advance his standing with his bosses. And you wonder, eh, he Christian meh? I see some of you are smiling. There are some people in mind. Or in a better light, have you heard testimonies of how an auntie, when she became a believer, she had such a profound change in her life. She became generous, kind, helpful, as she substantially impacted the rest of the extended family. And over the years, many of her relatives trusted in Jesus Christ when she shared the gospel. Have you heard of stories like that? Or perhaps you know of someone personally. How should we live our lives in front of, the, of a watching world? You know, God has a lot to say about how we live our lives and the good works that we do. Paul's instructions to Titus and to us as a church in Titus 3 tell us how we live as believers matter to our watching world and matter to God. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. Uh, if you have your physical Bible, please take it out, turn to uh, Titus chapter 3. Uh, we'll be going through verses 1 to 15. If you have a smartphone, you can also uh, turn to Titus 3. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, Titus chapter 3. Chapter, uh, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, 
by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions and quarrels about the law for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speak Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. The big idea, the big idea for this passage is the gospel results in good works that gives testimony to our Saviour. I repeat, the gospel results in good works that give testimony to our Saviour. And uh, this is the outline for today. We have three parts, uh, verses 1 to 2 and 12 to 15. It tells us we are to be devoted to good works that testify to the gospel. Verses 3 to 8, we receive the gospel that gives us new lives and is out of this new life that results in good works. And verses 9 to 11, we avoid false teachers that harm our gospel testimony. As we hear from God's Word, let us understand God's purpose for us as a church, Acts, is to devote ourselves to good works arising from the Gospel. And as we do so, thereby testifying to the Gospel. So let us now hear from the text. Let's look at verse 1. And verse 1 begins with, remind them, remind them. Paul instructs Titus to encourage the church in Crete to remember to act in a certain way. Manner. That's what he means by remind them. And, and we see that Paul's instruction flows from what uh, Josh preached last week out of Titus 2, uh, verses 11 to 15, which actually describes or tells us gospel doctrine or what the gospel is. In the context of this letter, the Cretan Christians, the Christians uh, that were found on the island of Crete uh, where Titus lived, they lived in a culture that was hostile to the gospel and they were corrupted by moral sin. Uh, and I'm not just saying this. Remember your Bible, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. Ty uh, Paul himself writes that Cretans were known in the Asian world as liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Not, not very flattering, right? But Paul, rather than command, commanding, the Christian, commanding the Christian to separate into their holy huddles, Paul took the Cretan Christians to task. They were not to live as their society lives. They were instead to live counter-cultural, distinctly different lives that arises from the gospel. My friends, this same command applies to us living in 21st century Singapore. We are to live lives that testify to the gospel. And hear Paul's instruction in verses 1 to 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. A statement of several commands, and if you look at it and you count, there are actually seven commands that Paul gives here to the Christians on the island of Crete. And these seven commands fall roughly into four groups of behaviours that he instructs us uh, to live. Firstly, we see in verse 1, we are to submit obediently. We are to submit obediently. 
we are to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. So it tells us as Christians, we are, although we are to live counter-culturally, we are not to be rebels. We obey the government unless it brings us, in, unless obeying the government brings us into direct conflict with the commands of God. And even then, uh, when, we, uh, when we, we lift out in such a way that it uh, expresses civil disobedience, that means we disobey the government in some way, this disobedience is passive, not active. We, we are willingly accept the consequences of our actions. So if, if the government tells us to do something like not worship on Sunday uh, and don't give us any good reason for that, we will then worship on Sunday, uh, we do it passively, uh, but uh, we'll be willing to actually accept any consequences for our action. That's what it means by uh, uh, having a civil disobedience that is passive. A and by submitting in this way, it gives evidence of our submission to and our trust in God. Secondly, the second group of behaviours we ought to, to uh, lift out, we, li we serve eagerly. We see that in verse 1 as well. We are to be ready for every good work. The word here is every. You know, not some, not most of the time, but every. It tells us to do good in every areas of our life. You know, we look to aid our neighbours, uh, assist our colleagues, we help others at every opportunity. Thirdly, we are to speak gently. We are to speak evil of no one and we are to avoid quarrelling. We see that in verse 2. We malign and curse no one with our words. We do not stir up strife and division, but we are peaceable, we are gentle, we are uncon uncontentious, we are forbearing, we are friendly, we are considerate, we refuse to hold a grudge and we give others a benefit of the doubt. As far as possible, as Paul commands in another letter, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, we seek to live at peace with everyone. Fourthly, we show gentleness. We are to be kind or considerate, always showing kindness and graciousness to everyone. We show perfect courtesy or humility as we put others ahead of us. We are to live distinctly different lives. And this arises from the work of the gospel in us, in our hearts. If you look carefully, if you drop down to the end of chapter 3, book ending chapter 3 is the instruction to be ready for or devote ourselves to good works. And we see this at the start of the chapter in verse 1, as well as near the end of chapter in verse 14. So the closing remarks of our Paul letters, which we see in the next four verses, we don't only see the customary goodbyes. You know, every letter Paul writes, usually he'll say goodbye at the end. So it's not just the goodbyes, but he also reinforces what he has been saying throughout the letter of Titus to Titus. That is, he encourages Titus and the Cretan Christians to good works. We see again in verse 12 to 15. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people, you see that, devote themselves to what? Good works. So as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith, Grace be with you all. In these few verses, as Paul ends the letter, he sends a godly spiritual reinforcement, Artemis or Tychicus, to, to help Titus. Titus is then to set aside his work and move on to a new ministry that will soon take him to Dalmatia or modern-day Croatia. And his task there is to strengthen the church in that area. Paul also asked the church in Crete to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on the way. So Titus should send them on quickly because it's likely that uh, these two, the lawyer and Apollos, they actually said, uh, brought the letter to Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. And having done that, Titus should send them quickly on their way. And see that, ensuring that they what? Lack nothing. In helping the missionary team, the church at Crete will do what? Will do good works. 
Paul once again remain, remind Titus in verse 14, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. The church is commanded to learn. And the word learn here is related to the word discipleship. So the original word for disciple in the Bible is actually learner. So it's telling us here, we are to learn. We are to be disciples that learn. And what are we learn, uh, to learn to do? We are to devote. Interesting word, devote. So what does it mean to devote? It means to maintain a consistent pattern or lifestyle of good works. So it's not just doing good works here, then once in a while we do good works there. It's telling us, to encouraging us to live out a lifestyle of habitual good works to others. And the good works here, of course, include the good works of uh, chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. And, and these are to be our life habits. They are to be the norm and not the exception. Good works serve to help cases of urgent need in the church and will cause our lives to be fruitful and productive. But friends, you may ask me, how, how do good works then relate to the gospel? Titus 2.10 which was covered by Josh last week again, tells us, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour. So what does good works do? They adorn the gospel. When we live following gospel doctrines, our lives will be fruitful with good works that adorn or make attractive the gospel. Remember, good works are not the gospel. Good works are not what saved us. But Christians who live doing good works will kind of make attractive or prettify the gospel. And I was, was thinking of how to describe this. You know, on a wedding day, you see the bride. The bride is beautiful, right? I know some of you just got married as well. We had some wedding a couple of weeks ago. The bride is beautiful alone. And the wedding dress, no matter how attractive it is, is not the main attraction. The bride is. So, groom's husband, if you go in and you see and you think that and you focus attention on the dress and not your wife, you're going to be in trouble later. Okay? The wife alone is beautiful. She is the main point, the, main, uh, the one that is, we supposed to pay the most attention. But what the dress do is to make attractive the bride. That's what good works does. Good works it's not the gospel, good works is not the main thing, not the main attraction, but good works make attractive the gospel. And our way to think about this is the following saying by our old saint. Yes, I like to read old books. And, and, and what he says here is this, do not unsay with your lives what you say with your lips. Do not unsay with your life, it means how you live. Don't let that contradict what you say with your lips. Let your lives practice what your lips profess. So our good works then will then testify the gospel of our Saviour Jesus Christ to the watching world. My friends, how have our lives been fruitful with good works? Have we been gracious in our speech and actions with our families? You know, sometimes, uh, is with those that are closest with, with us, to us, that we are most harsh when we speak to them. So have we been gracious in our speech and actions with our families? Have we been kind and considerate to our colleagues at work? Have we done good to our classmates in school, those among us who are students, helping them with their school work? And all of us as citizens, have we been submitting to civil authorities in our lives as citizens of Singapore? You know, I know in our age, authenticity is valued in our culture. The number one thing, if you ask young people what they value, is authenticity. Okay? But being authentic, however, is not about living to express our desires and feelings. Authenticity for believers is to live true to who we are in Christ and not according to our individual desires. And verses 3 to 8 that follows tells us who we are, our new identity in Christ when we trust in Christ. So let us look at the following section. And, and we see that after the commands in verses 1 to 2, 
you know, we expect the Apostle Paul to then say, do your best and try hard to keep the instructions to do good works. You know, I, I expect Paul to say this, right? You know, my, my self-righteous heart, I'm sorely tempted to hear tips and strategies for doing good works. Or tell Paul, Paul, give us your plan that all churches can implement to do good works. However, gospel logic is different. Because you see here in the next few verses, rather than giving us tips and strategies to, to make good works our habit, what does Paul do? Paul anchor, anchors the doing of good works on the good news of the gospel. We see that in verses 3, because verse 3 starts with a 4. And when you see the word 4, it gives the grounds or it gives the basis for verses 1 to 2. Or because of the following verses 3 to 8, we can and should obey the command of verses 1 to 2. So look at verses 3 to 8, which uh, Chelsea actually read for us. And, and thank you for the selection of songs. Uh, wonderful songs and great prayer today. Uh, for we ourselves were one foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Paul starts with who we once were. Then something happened. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, not because of works done in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out on us, us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying, that means these verses here, is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people and for us as a church. Verse 3 to 8 tells us gospel doctrine of God our Saviour. But Paul starts with who we are, who we were in the past. My friends, one way to see our deep need for spiritual birth is to know the nature of sin deeply. We see that we need to be rescued when we see how deep we were enslaved in, in our sins in the past. And Paul notes how, that's, how sin has enslaved and help us captive in verse 3. And just camping on verse 3, we see the following. Sin deceives. We, all of us, with no exception, were once foolish. Okay? We were once foolish, meaning we were senseless, we were ignorant, we were without spiritual understanding, and we were led astray. We were led astray. We were deceived, we were misled, we were guided by another in the wrong direction. In short, sin made us blind and made us stupid. That's just where we were, where, who we were. We also see next that sin disobeys. Our natural bent is to disobey and seek after our own selfish ways. We were disobedient to God, to, our, to authorities, parents, everyone and everything. We were self-centered, we were self root self deceased Satan deceived rebels. And we didn't even know it before we came to Christ. What else? We see that sin dictates our lives. You know, we want to be free, we're professing to be free, but in those days when we were deep in our sin, we were actually slaves, slaves to a cruel and never satisfied taskmaster, sin. Lust and pleasure, passions and pleasure controlled us. We were fools to give ourselves to these two mistresses who promised so much but actually gave little of any real value. Sin detests. Verse 3, we live in malice. This word describes one with a vicious character who desires to bring good to no one. Malice. Sin desires. We live in envy with this unstoppable, unquenchable desire to possess what we do not have. And by definition, the envious person can never be satisfied with what he has and will always crave for more. Finally, sin destroys. We were hateful, 
hated by others, hating one another. This was our natural heart attitude. We were continually detesting or hating one another. All this in contrast with living a life of love that characterized the disciples of Jesus. We live a life of hated, hatred that gave evidence we were disciples of the devil. Why did Paul spend an entire verse just camping out on this? Because Paul wants us to know, remember from where you come from. Remember the depths of depravity and sin from which you were saved from. I know this is weighty, but the next uh, word is wonderful because it starts with but. But. We were headed towards death and destruction, but something wondrous happened. After showing who we once were, Paul shows what has been done for us in verses 4 to 8. You know, at one time in our lives, we were dead, we were doomed, we were depraved, condemned, with no hope and no future. But the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Saviour, appeared. In five verses, Paul unwraps this beautiful package of salvation for us, highlighting what God has done for us, highlighting these four precious truths that we see in this text. Paul begins with the primary and beautiful truth that God loves us. Both His goodness and His love made an appearance. You now We see the grace of God in, in chapter 2, verse 11, the glory of God in chapter 2, verse 13, and now the goodness of God in chapter 3, verse 4. This goodness, His love and kindness has its source in God our Saviour. And the object of God's love, us, sinners in need of grace. And the theme of Christ our Saviour appears here for the fifth or sixth times in Titus. Christ our Saviour saves us. Next, Paul gives us fantastic news. We were made alive. Or, this, or regeneration. This is what regeneration means. It means to be made alive. Paul begins by telling us how regeneration did not happen. Here his clear words. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. My friends, do you get that? Salvation is not earned. You were dead, spiritually without a heartbeat, no pulse, nothing. Can a dead person respond to any uh, things around them, any stimulus around them? Nothing. We were dead, we can't respond to God. Any good that we've done then was polluted government in the eyes of a holy God. But He delivered us from sin and slavery, rescued us from death, hell and the grave. Why? because of His kindness, His love, and His mercy. How did God save us? Through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration is new birth. We are made alive, a new creation in Christ. Regeneration washes us and makes us clean through the new birth. And renewal, what is renewal? It's the inner transformation or change of the inner being or heart. The Holy Spirit brings both about. We are given new life by the Spirit. Our hearts are changed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. And we see that God is gracious and kind. Next slide, please. When He gives us His Spirit, He poured, us, poured out His Spirit on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Yet this, look at the, the text. God is not stingy. He gives us super abundantly. You know, Paul, Paul at this point probably looks back to Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit in Acts 2. However, what God did for believers gathered in the upper room then, He now does for every believer at the moment of our rebirth or regeneration before we place our faith in Jesus Christ. His Spirit come to be with us and in us generously, abundantly. That was what God did for us. And then in verse 7, we are justified. To be justified means 
to be declared or counted righteous. We are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Because of Christ's righteousness, Christ came, He lived a life fully obedient to God, He's fully righteous. When we put our faith in Christ, His, faith, His righteousness is given to us, is imputed to us. And we stand before God just as if we have never sinned. And just as if we had always obeyed God perfectly. We are declared justified. And how did we come to this legal pardon, this position of righteousness before God? Was it because of anything we did? No. Because it, were, it was because of His goodness and kindness. Verse 4, His love. Verse 4, His mercy. Verse 6, His grace. Verse 7. These are what move God to save us. Being saved is all of God. And having saved us, regenerated us, renewed us and justified us, God tells us the final truth. He comforts us with a word about our future. Not only now we receive all this, but verse 7 tells us we are heirs to the hope of eternal life. We will have eternal life, a never-ending life of joy in God's presence. This truth is our reality. Though it's not fully realized right now, we can be sure that this inheritance will be fully received when Christ comes back again. As a work of our triumph God, the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit, our future hope is signed, sealed and settled. This is what we'll definitely receive. No, my friends, how do we feel? We, we hear in this uh, few verses a lot of gospel doctrine. But how do we feel, my friends, to hear what God has done when He saved us, when He saved you, when He saved me? I'm personally filled with amazement and gratitude that Christ will save such a sinner such as me. What about you? Paul ends in verse 8 with this saying is trustworthy. What saying? Is verses 3 to 8 or the doctrine of the gospel? And, and the saying is trustworthy emphasizes the importance of the words that Paul shared. And you realize that this was addressed to who? To Titus, to stress and talk about this where? Among Christians in the church. Many of us think that the gospel is for unbelievers. Yes, the gospel need. The unbelievers need to hear the gospel. But in this context here, Paul was writing to Titus, instructing Titus to stress this word, this trustworthy saying, saying to the Christians in the church. So Christians, we too need to be hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel should be preached, taught, reminded, and even sung often. Because Christians, we have believed and do believe the gospel uh, and because of that, we should devote, be careful to devote ourselves, themselves, to good works. The new birth will result in new life. God's good work in giving us new life has overcome the evil works uh, that binds us in sin. And the beauty of our new life lived out declares to others that Christ can change them too. The gospel results in good works that give testimony to our Saviour. And this outcome is a great reward for us, whom the gospel of King Jesus has saved. Indeed, these things are excellent and profitable for people. So my friends, we do good works, not because good works save us, but we do good works because through our faith in Christ, God has given us new life and changed us through His Spirit. And it's out of this new who we are in Christ that we do good works for others sake, thereby giving testimony to Jesus Christ who saves us. You know, what is faith? Faith is believing in the promises of God uh, that they are trustworthy and true. So for my non-Christian friends here, do you want to know new life and to be freed from the enslavement of sin? Then acknowledge that you are a sinner who needs saving and cannot help yourself. Believe that God is our Saviour. And He promises to give you new life and new heart through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
confess that you need Jesus and you trust Him, uh, that you'll be justified, declared righteous before God by faith in Jesus Christ. And if this is your desire, if this is your desire and you're here with a friend, you can speak with your friend, or you can speak to Roy, to Joshua, to Pastor Shu Haobing, or me or any of the leaders at, Chang, at, at, at X Baptist Church. You know, you do reach out to us and we'll be glad to walk you through receiving God's Son, Jesus Christ. How about uh, us as Christians, my Christian friends? One of the habits we need to cultivate is to remembering who we used to be before God saved us. How might remembering who we used to be uh, before we received Christ encourage us in our present walk with Him? Because when we remember our sinful past, it cultivates compassion for fellow sinners. If we remember that we were once like that, but by the grace of God, we recognize that other sinners, fellow sinners, we are no different. We, have been, we are the same, except that we have saved, been saved by God's grace. And that cultivates compassion for them. So that we'll reach out to others around us. And we will grow. And this remembering who we once were before God saved us will grow gratitude in our hearts. And it's this gratitude that motivates us to do good works. Ex Baptist Church, we need to give the gospel the main thing in our life together as a church. So help one another remember the good news. Insist on preaching and teaching the gospel. Help one another by seeing the gospel in hymns and spiritual songs. And share our testimonies when we meet. You know, my friends, have you experienced the joy of regeneration and rebirth? If you have, you can share the testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ often and openly. Remember by rehearsing how God in Christ has saved you. You know, when I, when I have people come over to my home for dinner, I often ask them, uh, especially those whose testimony I have yet to hear, to share the story of God's mercy and grace in their lives. And I also will share my testimony as well. You know, what better way than to get to know one another in the church but by, uh, by, by reminding us of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, so hearing the testimonies, celebrating the saving kindness of God in Jesus Christ will not only help us to get to know one another, but it will also will proclaim the gospel and encourage our hearts. A good testimony focuses on gospel doctrine and adorns the gospel. But recognize that there are also bad testimonies, especially bad life testimonies that hinder, obscure or distort the gospel. And it's to these that we turn to now in our final verses and time together in verses 9 to 11. Verses 9 to 11. Paul, final words to one of his sons in the ministry, Titus, was to repeatedly challenge those at Crete to maintain sound doctrine and good works. Those who will teach errors or cause compromise in either area must be confronted or if unrepentant, avoided. Look with me your Bibles to the final three verse for today in Titus 3 verse 9 to 11. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. In verse 9, Paul contrasts verses 1 to 8, which insists on good works. Okay? He tells us in this to avoid what is foolish. Okay? We see there, we have to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions and quarrels about the law. And, and he addresses directly the false teachers that he talked about in Titus 1, who were adding works to the doctrine of salvation by grace through, Christ, uh, through faith in Christ alone. Not only did they have a gospel plus theology, but they also enjoy arguing about theology, you know, particularly matters related to the law of Moses and fanciful, strange understanding of Jewish genealogies. Paul is direct and to the point, he scolds them there. Such arguments and controversies are what? Not only unprofitable, but worthless. No point. Don't do it. Worthless. 
The goal of these false teachers was to divide and to stir up trouble. And Paul had little patience with such individuals. He directed Titus and the church on what to do in verses 10 to 11. And hear this as well. He actually, this, this commandment actually applies for the churches uh, um, around today as well. What are we to do? We are to practice church discipline. So when we become aware of a sinning brother or sister, Jesus gives clear instructions in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 20. What are we to do? We should go to them individually first. Second, we witness. And finally, the whole church is to be involved if there's no repentance. And it's not any trivial sin uh, or, or, or any sin because if that's the case, then all of us here will be disciplined out of the church. The sin that he's, Paul, uh, uh, Jesus talks about here is what? He talks about sin that is public, that is habitual, that is serious, and one which the person lacked repentance. Because if at any point there's evidence of genuine repentance, the process of discipline stops and the ministry of restoration begins. We see in particular here in Titus chapter 3 that Paul commands the church to warn the divisive person once, twice. And if there's no repentance, the whole church, we are to avoid such person. This man is warped and sinful. Verse 11. He has a settled mind, a settled state of heart and mind of unrepentance. He is more in love with his sin than in love with Jesus. He is stirring up division and this is a continuous habit of life. And if we truly love this person, we will not stand by and do nothing. As, to, as they go on sinning. Paul uses the word self-condemn here and it's, in the original language, it means to judge down on oneself. This person may not see it, but he's warped, he's twisted and self-deceived. He may even attempt to use scripture to justify his sin. Often he will claim the leading of his heart or the spirit. But in action and attitude, the sinner is without excuse, passing judgment on, on himself. And as church with grief, humility, self-examination and broken heart, we must confront him and if necessary, avoid him as a church. We must turn him over to Satan with a hope and prayer that the discipline of God, our Heavenly Father, will bring him to brokenness and repentance. What does this look like practically in Baptist churches? We remove an unrepentant repentant sinner from church membership. We say to them, brother or sister, you are unrepentant sin and you still want to stay in your sin, you know, based on your persistent, habitual unrepentance, we as a church, we cannot affirm your profession of faith. That's what it means to actually put someone out of membership in a church. We are saying to the person, right now, because of your habitual sin, we can't confirm and affirm your profession of faith. And we exclude him from the Lord's, him or her from the Lord's Supper and from members' meeting but we continue to reach out to the person with the gospel. We treat him as unbeliever, we evangelize him, reach out to God with the gospel and urge them to repentance. My friends, you know, as we talk about church discipline here, we need to understand that to make disciples, discipleship involves discipline. And we even see this in our child raising, right? If we see our child misbehaving, we will discipline our child for their we love our children too much not to discipline them for their good. Likewise, it's the same for us as a church. You know, in this short series of uh, Paul's letter to Titus, we saw how as a church, we are to lead according to gospel doctrine by appointing elders and guarding against false teaching in Titus chapter 1. We have a gospel culture as a church by living out the applications of the gospel in our life together as a church across the generations in Titus 2. And finally, today in Titus 3, we see God's purposes for us. We are to devote ourselves to good works arising from the gospel, thereby testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this means if we need to remove any bad testimony, we are to do so as well as we exercise church discipline. My friends, as we end this time together, I want us to take this moment to consider. 
in what ways can I be doing good works that will testify to the gospel? In what ways, right now, in the areas of life that God has put you in, can I be doing good works that will testify to the gospel? How can I be kind? How can I be considerate in my words? How can I help others? How can I aid others in various ways, in very practical ways of love, so that I, I will adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ? In what ways can I be doing good works that will testify to the gospel? And as we end this time together, my friends, remember that we, that every Christian, we are a sinner of whom Paul writes in Titus 3, 5. God saved us. We were hated for destruction and separation from God. But now, we are heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we devote ourselves to good works arising from the gospel, thereby testifying to the gospel. And doing so, as we testify to the gospel, we will glory in our good, loving and kind God. So as we end and respond to our final song, heed and hear the, these lyrics. Uh, I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on a judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death, my only Saviour before the right Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the Gospel, the good news that while we were yet sinners, you loved us and saved us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on our cross in our place, for the forgiveness of our sins. Your power raised Jesus Christ to life so that if we place our faith in Him, we will know new life. We will know the future hope of a resurrected life with You. Lord God, help us to remind one another of the Gospel often and spur us on to love and good deeds for our neighbours, friends, colleagues and families so that we will devote ourselves to good works arising from the Gospel, thereby that testifying to the gospel. We ask this for the sake of your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you just remain, be seated. Uh, we're going to respond in worship through the words of this song. And as Eddie prepares that, um, shortly thereafter, we have about five minutes for us to just share and encourage one another how have you gleaned, learned, and therefore the reflective question to put into practice the good works that we can put on, do in the week ahead. This blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree.
So before I dismiss you with some announcement and also the benediction, would you take the next five minutes, find a partner and just share openly where you are in your reflection. And the question was, has been, in what ways can I be doing good works that will testify the gospel? Okay, in what ways can I be doing good works that will testify the gospel? Let's take the next five minutes to do so, please. <laughs> 